Hello, good evening, welcome. It is The Late Show and it is Monday night and it is live as well. So we want you to take part in tonight's program just as any other live show that we have. So all those numbers that are gonna come up on your screen, live at revelationtv.com. Uh, we're gonna have some fun tonight as if, as if we never have fun on a live show, uh, but we do. We've got a special guest tonight, it's Jonathan Mensa. Good evening, Jonathan. Good evening, Howard. Yeah. He was scared before he came <laughs> on the set, but we did the warm-up. And yeah, who was yeah. that? But nothing but Mark the cabbie warmed him up with a bit of a laugh, right? A bit of a laugh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, actually, it's gone crazy before we've gone live, hasn't it? We're yeah. laughing about, so we've got, to, we've got to be serious now. Really? We've got to take oh, this Oh, that's serious. a shame. <laughs> I, I just want to mention Dad is in the corner as well. Jonathan's dad, Michael. Good yeah. evening. Big crowd yeah. tonight. Yeah, big crowd, yeah. But <laughs> all of one person. But you know who's really watching is that all the angels. Yeah, I mean, do you know how many angels there are? out yeah. there. Myriads, right? Yeah, literally myriads, yeah. Okay. Wow. So, I mean, never mind Revelation TV viewers only having mostly viewers in Pakistan and Iran. I mean, Which God knows true. why. Yeah, I know, that's, that's true. The viewerships in Pakistan, you said yeah. the other night. I know, but no, no, no. That. It's in the heavenly. It is. Yeah, it is. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you should watch us more. Oh, yeah. I will do. <laughs> well, you, you, the, the stats are uh, phenomenal. You know, we've got three viewers in Iran. <laughs> three. <laughs> Ten in... Donald Trump, Donald Trump watches on the Tuesday, doesn't he? Yeah, but he's always tweeting, on. you know? Oh, well. <laughs> tweeting. Now, we're going to get serious now, yeah, because I, right. God has got you here for a reason. I have no idea what it is. As I said to you when I met you, I said, I don't want to know about your story, because I want you to be able to tell us, and we can all react at the same time. Our viewers are lovely out there, Jonathan, uh, so you won't get away with anything tonight, because they'll be writing in. <laughs> say, how did he get that six back? <laughs> uh, that's the secret. <laughs> Uh, well, I've lost mine. It's turned, it's turned into a 20 pack all rolled in one. And uh, mine's becoming you? a bargain bucket, isn't it? That's it, yeah. <laughs> That's what caused it. Ooh. Now, seriously, I mean, we're going to be talking about a topic which, according to the notes that I've got in front of me, <laughs> is the rise of the gun and knife crime. Uh, why is that associated with you then, John? Well, I've actually been involved in knife and gun crime. Um, at a very young age, um, starting around 12. And I've been involved in that, just coming out of my comfort zone and just trying to find who I was. And in that culture, there's so much bonding, there's so much material things you want to have as a young person. There's so much fame that you can build up, you know, to be well known as the bad guy or the street guy. And yeah, and it's been a very interesting journey um, being involved in that. And even growing up now and just seeing how it's still going on is mm. it's quite crazy and sad at the same time. Right. So, interesting, I mean, you boned up straight away that you were involved in that. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it was at the, the wrong level. It wasn't at the right level where you were trying to uh, intercept and change people's minds. You were sucked into it, where you were into yeah. the gang culture, yeah? Yeah. How old were you? I was 12 when I started into it. And, um, yeah, I was in my estate. And literally, I was just playing football, and I really like football. Good man. And yeah, football. One, I yeah, mean, football you know. indeed. <laughs> and yeah, literally, one of the guys who were involved just somehow saw something in me, and he was like, "I like you." And from then, we built up a relationship, and I just started to realize that he's one of the biggest guys in the estate. And from then, he just started to teach me the ropes of so how to be in a street gang life. And from then, that's when I start to build up my status, start to build up my role in being in the street gang. And then I became like a mini youngster. Mm. A gangster? Yeah, mini gangster. <laughs> Tell us, help us to understand, because I, I mean, from what we hear, there's all sorts of reasons why people get uh, involved in gangs. And, and I can see because you've got your dad here, that it wasn't because you're single uh, parented, right? Yeah. So you came from a stable home. Yeah. And probably a Christian home. Yeah. So how on earth did you make that sort of decision to, you know, want to be part of the gang? What, what is it that young people like yourself can so easily get, you know, sucked into it? Yeah, um, it's tough being a young person because, <clears throat> you know, as a young person, you want, it, you want attention. You want to be known by everyone. You want to be comforted. You want to be accepted. And when you may see a group of people that you like to be involved with, but they're not accepting you, you can feel rejected, you can feel like you're worthless, you can feel like, you know, what's the point of living if I'm not being accepted by a group of people that I like? But then, as a young person, you're always searching. 
always search until you find someone or until you find that group of people that says yes to you. And sometimes that group of people may say yes because they can see how they can use you, not really how they can benefit you and help you to be the person you want to be. So when I thought I found a group that accepted me, which they did, I didn't know the consequences of that acceptance, you know, the consequences of doing things in order to be within the gang, um, to be accepted in the gang, to um, carry the gang's name. And um, because I was accepted, because I was loved, and um, because it, it looked fun and everybody was involved, I needed to do what was required of me as a mini gangster or a mini gang member at that time. Because if I didn't do it, then I would lose that acceptance, I would lose the money, uh, I would lose that fantasy of life that I was living at the time. And so it's, there's, there's that fear of, okay, if I don't join, I won't be accepted, I feel neglected, I'm worthless. And then there's that, that drive where it's like, but if I am accepted, I can actually do so much more, I can actually be more liked by this group of people that I want to be involved in. And that's, that's what drew me in, because I thought there was something better outside than what was at home. Mm. Wow. So what was your initiation? Ah, my initiation was that I really just wanted to be well known. And from there, because at home, uh, being the oldest as well, I always looked up to some of my friends who had older brothers. And because I didn't really have that and realised that was me, I wanted to actually look out through someone else that was a man figure. Um, no, no disrespect to my dad, um, it's just one of them ones where, you know, when at a young age you may think that certain things are good for you, you don't see as cool, you don't see as right. So because I didn't see that in my home, because I didn't see that in my family, and I saw it on the streets, I thought, you know what, let me take this decision to actually go out and enjoy what this coolness looks like and to discover it even more. And the more I discovered the coolness, the more I became deeper in the coolness and the more I started to see the darkness in that street life. So that's, that's what initiated me to you. But the initiation process usually is go and do something to prove that you are part of the gang, yeah. which we hear today, sadly, is probably go and take somebody else's life yeah. with a knife. Yeah, yeah. And were you asked to do anything like that? Um, I wasn't asked to do anything like that, but I didn't, I didn't really want to build up a stage where I wanted to kill people but it was more of like, I wanted to threaten them. So whether it was, you know, having fights with them or even threatening to fight them. Um, and sometimes if I saw someone that was stronger than me, I'd definitely go for a weapon so that I'm just threatening them to let them know that I'm bigger than you, I'm stronger than you, and to let them know that, you know, don't mess around with me. But at the same time, it was more of like, just building that hatred towards them so that the other guys are scared of me and I did build that and some of them weren't scared of me and some of them were but those who were scared of me I made sure that that's the level that they're at whenever they see me whenever they talk to me because I wouldn't want one of them to disrespect me but if they do then so it's down to the respect you know yeah. and the credibility in the in your neighborhood or whatever yeah yeah definitely but you're a fierce fearful fearsome man yeah so did you use a weapon, you were saying? Was it a knife? Um, I had a knife at times, and it was just to look good. Just to look good, to look bad, whether it's in the estate, because mm -hmm. um, in each estate you're protecting your community, you're protecting your home, you're protecting your family, and you know some of your enemies can come in, so you always have to make sure you're on guard. So sometimes I would have a knife you know, in my waist just to make sure anyone comes to touch me, or anyone's tried to do something bad, I'm ready to attack. Um, but thankfully, I haven't used it. Um, it was just there as a protection. And at the time, I also had a gun, which I was passed over to to look after. And with that, it came with consequences. Um, and I didn't know that I would get to that point in my life, mm. because I just thought, wow, well, I thought I'd be holding these guns and knives on a game. <laughs> I didn't know it would actually come to real life. So when it became a reality, it was like, wow, like this is really real, and I need to be wise in how I'm going to use this, or how am I going to treat uh, my life with it. What sort of gun was it? A Glock? It was a shotgun, sure enough. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Wow. Do you know how it, this reminds me of the basic yearning in every person's life is identity and purpose. Yeah. That's all to be accepted. You, uh, you mentioned love as well. Yeah. Okay. So we all want to be loved, have a purpose and identity. And we all search for it in the wrong place. Yeah. Because that's our natural bent, that's our natural hearts. This is an amazing story. I, I, mm. This is. He's only, I asked him his age at the start, he's only 25, he's yeah. half my age, and it sounds like he's packed in more stuff in mm. half my age than I ever will, you know?
God has really been yeah. gracious. Can you... Wow. Joseph, uh, Jonathan, sorry. Can you actually say that it was anything to do with your colour? That you felt that you had to assert yourself in a certain way? Do you think there was anything there that had a, like a, you know, the, you want to fight back against the system, which is predominantly white, you know? Um, no, I wouldn't say it was regarding my colour, because even there was other different colours there, you know, you had some guys that I was with that were Asians, you even had some British guys that were there that were white, so there was always a mixture of us in the gangs, or even in, in the different gangs was, I was involved in. So I wouldn't say it was of colour, it was more of like our territory. We wanted to make sure we're the biggest, baddest, strongest ends or estate in London, yeah. um, or well, particularly in our area, in our region, because we didn't want no one else to mess around with us. We wanted to be the kings. And, you know, as a king, you know, you want to be respected as a king. You want to be looked up highly as a king um, or as a big man, which is a term. You want to make sure that everyone respects you and no one doesn't mess around with you. So it's more to protect your, uh, your own area. It wasn't necessarily to control and s go into somebody else's area and to cause problems or to get involved in drug uh, dealing or anything like that? Oh, oh yeah, drugs. Like, in our area, there were so many drugs taking place, so many drugs even going out from our area to a different area. And if one also that, you know, when we did hear of someone, for example, getting Russian I in our state by another enemy, then we'll go to the enemy's territory and do something bad to one of their members. And then it's going to, it was always going back and forth, back and forth. Um, so yeah, it was definitely about protecting our area. It was definitely about if someone does something bad to one of our guys, we'll go to that enemy's area and attack them. And definitely drugs was going around. But because um, of the person that looked after me, he kind of disciplined me to keep away from the drugs. But everything else, <laughs> he gave me a green light. So was there any sort of, um, if you like, on a gangster level, was there any sort of like um, buying and selling of uh, trading drugs or other contraband? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, you know, people buying weed, um, people trading even guns, you know, go to the certain place, this guy will give you a gun and come back and it's yours just like that. Um, so literally, I remember some guys were just saving so much money just to buy quite a few guns and even just seeing drugs just being passed through through the estate and going out. Yeah, it was, it was quite a lot seeing that at a young age, but it was literally like the lifestyle every single week. So a lot of that was happening. Mm. So I, trying to understand, you, uh, at 12 years of age, this is when you started. So did you um, gain you know, notoriety in your own gang and did you get to a different level where you were more a commander or whatever you yeah. called? Yeah, so um, in the gang life, I started as a younger, so there's younger, you got mandem, and then you got the oldest. And as a younger, because I had an older who looked after me, um, and also depending on their age, um, I was literally one of the youngest that was well known in the estate because my older was well known as well. So as you grow up, you you know start to learn that these are your friends or your family, and these are the enemies. So you get to know these different kind of people who are enemies to you, who are your allies per se. And then you kind of like meet up with your allies. So you go to your allies' estate, chat with them, get to know them. They know you, you know them. So you're cool. So let's say we go to a different shopping center and I see your ally, we won't get attacked because we know each other, we're cool. But if we see someone that we don't know, that's from a different estate, then we start trouble with them. Um, so yeah, then after you go through like 12, 13, um, you become uh, part of the mandem, um, where you're quite mature now. So now you are respected by the youngers. The oldest know you. You're now taking charge. Now you're training the other youngers to follow your um, ways, to follow your um, rules in the street life. And that's what I did. I kind of had a little mini youngers that I was teaching, you know, how to get the girls, how to get the money, you know, to make sure that they're protecting our community, to protecting the gang, and to make sure that they don't be catch slipping, catch slipping, meaning that they don't get um, caught out on their own by some of our enemies. Um, so yeah, there is that kind of rank where you know you started younger, you become the mandem, and then when, if you're in the game for long, you become an older. Um, and older means that you got younger ones that you're looking after, that you're sometimes controlling um, to do what you want um, in order to what well, benefit from the youngers or to make sure the youngers are strong in the game. Mm. So as a younger, what sort of things were you asked to do? Um, so I remember the first time I was with my older and some of the other guys and we went to a different estate. 
And he told me, you know, you see that big guy, I want you to punch him. So I was 12, I was skinny, wasn't this big. <laughs> so I was scared. And I was thinking, man, like, I want to please him. Like, I want to make him happy, but if this guy beats me up, you know, will I look like a weak guy? Will I be cast? Will I be, you know, you know, the one called out as a weakling? So I didn't want that. So I toughened up myself. I went towards the guy and I grabbed him by his chest and I was like, you know, give me your money or I'll beat you up. And obviously he was laughing because I'm thinking in my head, oh my dear, this guy, <laughs> he thinks I'm joking. So, um, so yeah, I told him, I'll give you 10 seconds, gave him 10 seconds, and then I, I, I banged him. Um, didn't move, didn't flinch, and I went back to my order uh, with my head down. I was thinking, oh man, I flopped it. Um, but a few seconds after I did that, um, the rest of our guys went around this guy and just beat him up. And from then, he was like, yeah, you're, lo you're loyal, because I did what he said for me to do. And from there, I started to learn that, okay, I need to make sure I'm doing what my oldest is saying so that I can gain up my respect or gain up my rankings, per mm -hmm. se. Um, so the more I started to do that, whether it was, you know, chatting to girls, you know, on the bus, even I don't even know them, but to build up my ranking, to build up my, my, res my reputation, I needed to do what my older was telling me or what another older was telling me because it was like the more older that got your back, the more you're protected, per se. So if anyone touches you, you can call your older or your oldest and they'll come sort and deal with your issues because you've gained their respect by doing what they're telling you to do. Um, so I was doing that, um, even involved in my education at school, you know, where it's bunking classes, not listening to the teacher, um, you know, doing form fights, uh, or even fighting our enemies, because I was at a school where some of our enemies were actually there, so I had to be on guard. Um, where it was, you know, going to Raven, staying out light, late with the friends, and then coming back home late. And, you know, sometimes going to, we had a little, um, car park where we did like um, radio shows, like um, doing some rapping. So go there late night, you know, share some bars or lyrics. And so that was literally the lifestyle that I was doing as a younger. Um, but I always had to make sure that I was in contact with my older to know what's the next things that we need to do. How long did it take you before you realized this isn't what I wanted to do? <sighs> it took me about a good three years. A good three years, because um, I got to the point where, you know, after getting caught with the shotgun and going in jail for remand and coming out, and thank God, I don't know how he did it, but I didn't do my six years, uh, which I was supposed to do. Um, I just thought that, you know what, I just, I just didn't, I wasn't satisfied. Um, I didn't like the way people were just getting killed. Um, I mean, one time I went to Carnival, and I think this was the first time I saw a dead body. And I just saw the dead body with the blood coming out. I'm like, wow, like, people are dying. And I looked at myself, I was like, wow, like, I'm beating up people. You know, I'm getting beaten up by people. I'm getting chased by people, getting chased by police. And I'm thinking, what am I going to be like when I'm older? <laughs> if I'm going to continue like this, like, what are we all going to be like when we're older? You know, what are we going to tell our children if we have children? Like, I didn't want this life anymore, but then there was so much good in this life that I couldn't trade it for anything else um, until, you know, I heard the truth, the gospel that, you know, someone can change me from the inside out. Even though, you know, I was a great liar, even though I loved the money, even though I loved the girls, um, I just knew that all of that wasn't satisfying me. And I knew there was something missing. I thought the love I was missing was found in the gang. I thought the bonding, I thought, you know, um, the acceptance was found in the gang, but it was still missing. It was still missing, felt like there was an eternal hole in me that the gang life couldn't fill for some reason. So when I came to that realization and I heard the gospel, knowing that all the stuff that I did was just a shadow of my sins that was confusing me and filling my heart up, but it wasn't really filling my heart up. It was just a temporary feel. It was like, um, it's like a, like a blue tack, it's just wearing out. And then you have to replace it with a new blue tack on the wall if you want to stick on something. So it was like that temporal blue tack just filling my heart. But when I heard the gospel and knowing that all these things that I've done was just blinding me, I thought, you know what? It makes sense. That was filling my heart with the wrong stuff that couldn't fit in that hole in my heart. Um, so yeah, that's when I came to the realization that I didn't want this life anymore. I didn't want to do the stuff I was doing. I didn't want to, I just didn't want to do evil. Mm. Was there a particular scripture that you, you came across that spoke to you and made you think, oh, this is what I, 
I've got to get out of this. Life. Yeah, um, I remember I was, when I was in jail for a month, um, I remember I was going to church, Sunday school, and... Um, in, after, in jail? Yeah, in jail. Um, and I met the chaplain, and she gave me a Bible. And um, even though I threw my, my previous Bible in the bin, uh, but I brought it to my cell because I had nothing to read. And I was reading the part in um, Corinthians where Paul says that, you know, he's the worst sinner of all sinners. And I came to the realization that, wow, there's actually bad people in the Bible. Like, <laughs> I never knew. I just thought it was all angels, God, uh, all yeah. these good people. But when I saw this scripture where Paul was saying that he's the worst sinner of all sinners, it hit me because I was like, whoa, like, I can relate to this guy because I'm a sinner. And I've done bad stuff. But then how can this guy who killed so many Christians be talking about Jesus be living a good life, been loving, been forgiven, been, you know, in prison and he's still full of joy. Like, how, it didn't make sense to me. Um, so at that time, I didn't know God, I didn't know Jesus, but I remember the Lord's Prayer when it was mentioned in church or mentioned in primary school and I didn't know who I was talking to, but after reading that scripture, I just, I just knew that I needed to say the Lord's Prayer. And from then, I knew, and I, I had a feeling, not even a feeling, I, I just knew that was the right thing to do. And then from then, I started to have my journey of starting to learn about, wow, I think Jesus Christ is actually real. Amazing. Oh. When the, you know, this is so powerful because when people come to a crossroads in their life, they don't have to be down the same road as you. You know, it, it doesn't matter what they've done. When they start to read the scriptures, it, it is, so powerful. It is the Word of God that's alive. It's like it jumps off the pages mm. and it, like it speaks to you, doesn't it? So, yeah. You know, and it's sort of, no one else could tell you you're a sinner. But when you look at the Scriptures and God and the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and to your spirit, it convicts you, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Yeah. It really does. Absolutely amazing. So what happened then? You, you, how long were you in prison? So I was in prison for a month. Um, it felt like months because, you know, when you're waking up every day, you just see the same old thing, same old people. It's like, when am I getting out? <laughs> but yeah, I was in there for a month and um, I had a court meeting because they were trying to like do their investigations, making sure there's no one else involved. And after that, when, because I was young, I didn't know what was going on. After the judge smacked the um, the javel and I just thought, wow, I'm going to do my six years. Um, but then I started to hear my mom saying hallelujah. I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> Your saying, that. hallelujah. I'm thinking, yo, like... Well, she I'm... knew what was coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, me, I'm thinking, like, I'm going back to jail. But then, you know, one of my relatives explained to me, saying that, you know, you, you bust case, you're not going back. And I was like, wow. And I didn't know why. Um, but that's, that's, that's when I thought, now nah, something's definitely happening, but I don't fully understand what's happening. Yeah. So what happened when you came out of prison? Did, how did you uh, sort of speak to the gang uh, about this? Yeah. So afterwards, funny enough, my older was there at the court meeting and I remember he just took me to the barbers, got me a haircut yeah. and then I came back to the streets. But in my head, in my heart, I was like, okay, I'm keeping away from guts. Knives, I'll keep, but guns, not touching again because I, I don't want to go back to jail. I don't want to experience that. And, you know, just seeing the amount of young guys that were there and the stuff that they did, I just thought, you know, these guys are broken. These guys are lost. So that's why I gave myself that discipline. Don't touch a gun, don't carry a gun, just stick to knives. And so, yeah, I went back to the streets and, you know, still did the same old thing, still getting into trouble, you know, getting the girls, getting chased by police and chilling with my older. And it got to a point where I was chilling with one of my friends and he had a girlfriend who was a Christian. And it kind of baffled me, but then I remember this, um, the verse that Paul talked about, how he's the worst sinner of all sinners. So I was thinking, okay, so she's a Christian, does, she, does it mean she's still a sinner or, you know? So I wasn't really sure about her, but I started to like her. And I was kind of like a media at the time. So when they had problems, I'll go kind of like help them out. But then it finally broke up. So then I started to make my moves <laughs> to get to know her. And she invited us to a youth service. And I thought, okay, you know what? Cause I like you, I'll just go. And I thought it was um, a trap because there were other different enemies in the youth service. Really? So, yeah, so I was, was not too sure what was going on, so I sat at the back. Um, what was the safest place? Yeah, <laughs> the back is the safe place, close to the exit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I and mean, then, you know, the pastor was sharing about the gospel of Jesus, and I was thinking, you know what, if this Jesus can, you know, give me the right life or the good life, then let me try him out. Um, so I said to myself, okay, let me not lie for a week. Yep, that, 
definitely flopped um, in the next three days because um, I lied about my age to a girl that I really liked <laughs> just to get a number. And yeah, I just gave up because I was like, I can't, I can't lie, I can't tell the truth. Like, I need to lie. Like, lying is part of my blood. Um, but for some reason, I still like this girl. Um, so she invited me again to a youth service. So I was like, ah, you know what? Because I like you, I'll just go. <laughs> so we went to the youth service this time, but this time it was different. And the pastor was talking about being a leader, not a follower. And I literally sat there, and I remember I had a flashback of my life. I just saw myself following this guy. This guy's following that guy. That guy's following that guy. And we're all following each other, but we don't really know where we're going. We think we know where we're going, but we really don't know where we're going. And I started to ask myself, wow, like, who am I? You know, what's my identity like? Why am I even living? And all these thoughts start to come to mind. I'm thinking, I'm actually lost. <laughs> Like, I'm just literally following people, filling myself up where I don't really know what I really need to fill up myself with. Um, and then I remember him sharing the gospel and he was like, you know, Jesus Christ died for his enemies. I'm thinking, what? Like, in the street life, you don't die for your yeah. enemies. You know, you die you for kill your... them. Yeah, you, <laughs> you kill them. You know, you die for your friends, you die for your family. But yeah. when he said Jesus died for his enemies, I knew I was one of his enemies. Ooh. Because I did wrong to him, I sinned against him, I turned away to do my own thing and not do what he called me to do, what he originally wanted all mankind to do, to be with him and to live a good life. So I was thinking, whoa. And I just knew that, that conviction again came back. I was like, nah, like, this Jesus, is he real? And then he shared a gospel where, you know, he didn't even, not just died, but he rose again and he still lives and he's calling and seeking every, all mankind to see who would lead others to him. And in all my life, you know, I always wanted to be a leader. I always wanted to be a chosen one. Um, but sadly, I wasn't, you know, when it came to like football matches and, you know, they have the two captains and the two captains pick their favorite players. You know, I'm always the last one or one of the few last ones. And I always wondered why. Um, but when, you know, the gospel was shared and that, you know, God has given us significance. He has given us um, a purpose. He has given us, um, things that he has given us to glorify him and not only to glorify him, but for us to see and to enjoy. And I was thinking, wow, God, like, you truly see this in me? And like, you truly did this for me? You died for me? Even though I hated you? Even though I didn't even know you? Um, so yeah, so in 2009, at the age of 15, I received Jesus Christ into my life. And I just knew from then that something's changed. I knew that I was a new creation. I knew that I am born again. I knew that wow, I actually got Jesus living inside of me and now I can do good. Now I can think good. Now I desire to do good and I, I just, and I knew that, wow, I couldn't do it myself. I needed Jesus to give me that desire and he did. And um, yeah, it's been an amazing roller coaster um, since then. It reminds me of scriptures uh, talking about trans not being transformed into the ways of the world. And then when you become enlightened, as it were, uh, about what God really uh, wants for us, which is the best. He wants the best for us, but it never seems like that. It seems like, you know, it's all the bad stuff. You know, I mean, you know, it's not such fun, you know, being, you know, a do-gooder and goody-goody. Yeah. But the benefits are, are incredible. But it, it, and it's such a, a relief, isn't it? And it's such a release from uh, being bound by the world's standards and the ways of the world, which, as you said yourself, were evil. Yeah. You know? And realizing too, which not many people want to accept these days, is to realize that they're a sinner. Yeah. And that is something which this generation now, even more so, I'd say in the last few years, it's become, you know, the sort of de facto that you, we're not sinners, mm. you know, you know. So, be really yeah. good to have a look yeah. at your emails as well yeah, and see. One of the things that sticks in my mind with Jonathan is the fact that multitudes of people, Jonathan are justifying themselves before God. They're all sort of doing the nine to five bit, doing their best and, oh, I'm all right, I don't, I haven't murdered anyone, I haven't done this, yeah. I'm okay, I'm going to heaven, I think. And multitudes are on their way to a lost eternity because they think they're good enough. And the Lord came for people like Jonathan who are desperately searching for an identity and a purpose and to be accepted, mm. but looked in the wrong place. But when the Lord turned up in Jonathan's life, he, he he shone a, shone a light on Jonathan's heart and made him realise so quickly that actually I'm a bankrupt sinner, yeah. you know? And most people, 
are desperately trying to justify themselves their whole life going to a lost eternity. So this sounds like a nightmare start to a life, which it is, it, it absolutely is, but now you've got eternal life, Jonathan. Indeed. Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. Did your mum and dad have any part in, in the early years of your life in inculcating you in some ways in the scriptures and maybe that just lay dormant and it needed to be like the prodigal son? <laughs> yeah, no, they definitely did. I always remember my mum always praying, always there praying. There you go. And, you know, I remember one time, I, oh, no, even one time, you know, quite a few times I'll be going to bed and I feel someone touch my head. I'm like, what's this? My mom's praying for me. Oh. Or, you know, whether it's my dad just reminding me scriptures. Um, one of the favorite ones he gives me is Philippians 4.13. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And funny enough, when I became born again, I instantly, well, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I instantly remembered that scripture. I was like, oh, now I know what the scripture means. Um, so, yeah, now they definitely did their best to input and to teach me, you know, the word of God. But at the end of the day, um, definitely God's word has power. But at the same time, we need to respond to God's word. And, you know, some may think that, you know, I didn't do that at that time, which is true. But what I do believe is that when my parents were praying or sharing the word of God, the seeds were planted in me. And as the years go by, those seeds are just producing fruit. And those fruit always direct to the seeds that were planted. Yeah. Must have been very painful for your mum and dad though to see you get to the stage where, you know, you're, you're in prison. Yeah. You know? But these things happen and it needs to be as, you probably, was it your mum who was saying, oh, you know, great, you're, in, you're going to prison, you know? At least yeah. she knew that you'd be, you know, going to be reached. And you, you'd reached the bottom of the pile, as it were, you know, coming to that realisation that, you know, there's got to be more to life than me ending up in it this place. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I think people are doing what they always do when they're engrossed with someone's story, they're not texting in. So get on the text, guys. Get on the emails, text 07781 47 28 47, live at revelationtv.com. Any questions, any comments about an amazing young man's life, mm. bring them in now and uh, you'll be first on the board. You'll be yeah. first on the board. Send a test email in because we had some problems. We nearly never went live again. Oh, so right, generally. okay. There's always problems uh, at this end. But you know, we know. The enemy doesn't want Revelation TV to put out programs, and particularly when it comes to programs like you're listening to tonight. So coming back to the incredible rise in knife crime, we can see, I mean, with the experience that you've had, Jonathan, what would you say to the powers that be that could actually be more effective in helping and reaching young men like yourselves who got uh, sucked into the gang culture? Um. Now, in this gang culture, there's so much material things that us young men, well, us, yeah, us young men desire. Um, because those material things, they build up our identity. Those material things, they build up a picture that we want to depict and illustrate to other people. Um, but it all starts from, you know, how they've been brought up, what, they, what they've been taught. And, you know, the, the parents, um, you know, the friends, um, or even, you know, any pastors that may know these young men or even these young women um, that are involved in this culture, they actually have the power to share a word of encouragement. They have the power to share a word of light. They have the power to even pray for them. Um, but it's that consistency. Because, you know, every day they're getting filled with so many bad things which seems good to them. So it's the consistency of that good rising and rising or being approached them or giving them op that opportunity for them to see the good side of things. Um, but those, those powers, unlike, you know, even, even the government can help out, you know. I know that at the time, I think it was around 2009, 2010, when there was cuts, you know, to a lot of youth clubs, to a lot of youth projects. Um, and I can speak for myself as well, because I remember when I was in the street gang, we had so much youth clubs, and it did really, you know, help us to keep away from the streets, to be, you know, productive and, you know, keep ourselves busy. But if that's gone away, we're going to find something else to do, or, which leads us to getting into trouble. So the government, the local councils can have a help into this, but it's kind of like, seeing it from the person that's actually involved and hearing their voice. Um, but then sometimes we can't ignore their voices, but I pray and I continue to pray that, you know, those voices will be heard and then, you know, so many young men and young women can get out of this culture. Very good. Brilliant. Email. Okay. Do you know what? The enemy didn't want you here today, Jonathan, um, because we nearly never went live, did we? We had internet right. problems all day long, so I'm thinking, here we go again. 
they're here. They're all here. The emails are here. Hur hooray, you are live. I'm so pleased you sorted out the internet problem. Thank you for another great program. Love from Jane. Ah, oh, wow. Hi, Howard and friends. I'm one of your stats watching from my caravan in Bude tonight. I think that's Cornwall, isn't it? Bude? Oh, it's Seven. not Cornwall. Cool. <laughs> no, it's not Karachi. Oh, <laughs> got a hotbed of people in Karachi. <laughs> Yeah. You never thought you'd be big in Karachi, did you? Uh, no, 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 no way. <laughs> God bless you tonight as you discuss knife crime, etc. George, George uh, Radcliffe on Trent. Thank you, George. <laughs> Karachi. I must stop laughing at my own jokes. This is getting quite bad. Um, Hi guys. Nobody else will. <laughs> no, my, my kids are already thinking, oh, Dad. Uh, Hi guys, may the Lord pour out his anointing afresh upon the three of you and fill you with an unquenchable fire. That's our brother Frankie in Belfast. Uh, yeah, I have, the other one was Frankie in Hollywood, wouldn't it? Fra Frankie. He, no, he went to Hollywood, not Frankie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, he wouldn't remember, he's too young. He, he, <laughs> oh, he's miles too young. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, how old were you when you were carrying guns, uh, knives, and a gun? All right. Um, I was. It started when I was thirteen, but I got the gun when I was fourteen. That just slips off the tongue. But to me, that I was eating Big Macs at fourteen. You know? <laughs> like, you're, this is just. This is off the charts. This is unbelievable. Wow. Um, wow. This is. Hi guys. Gee, I'm mighty glad to have found your great channel whilst I was visiting your little country last week. Donald um, Trump. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Um, um, it's, <laughs> it struck me that all the other channels were stone cold losers. And thanks a lot, guys, from Donald Trump, also known as Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff always brings. <laughs> so the Donald is watching, right? All right. The Donald That's is when... <laughs> your little country. <laughs> oh, wow. This is one here from Dave. Interesting topic. Were your parents aware of all your activities? Ooh, nah, well, you don't have to say because they, 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 they weren't aware. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't aware, but um, but yeah, no, nah, no, nah, they, they weren't aware of it. But you know, every time I come home, they probably they can sense something has happened. But because I was a silent guy, bearing in mind I was a shy guy when I was young. By the way, I wasn't quite lively like this. Um, I was I was always good in keeping things in silent. So if you ask me if I'm fine, I'll be like, yeah, I'm fine, but I'm not really fine. A lovely one here from Ricky. I just switched on to Rev TV, and it's great to hear someone share how God entered into their life. How do you keep God in your life? It seems easy to have Jesus enter in, but not so easy to keep him amidst all the trials and the temptations. So how do you keep him afresh? You know what? It's, it's the people you're with. Yeah. You know, yes, definitely God gives you the desire to seek after him. But if you've got negativity around you, if you've got evil around you, more than, you know, godly, faithful people around you every day, surely you're going to be led astray, you know? But if you've got that good company, that good company wants you to see you grow in the Lord, that wants to invest in you spiritually, that, uh, that are willing to pray with you and you're willing to pray with them, and most importantly, you're willing to be accountable, which I've been learning quite recently um, a lot, that if you're willing to be accountable, willing to lean on someone and let someone lean on you, you'll surely grow. And that's what helped me because I chose, personally chose, every day to be around these sort of people. I've been through that. I was able to, you know, know that, wow. Not saying that I don't need those sort of people, but as I grew, I started to realize, wow, I can now rely on the Lord to guide me through as I continue to seek him. Fantastic. So, yeah. Oh, it's that consistency. Yeah, scripture there, if you walk with wise persons, you become wise. There you go, yeah. If you walk with those that are ungodly, um, you fare badly. Yeah. Bad company corrupts good character. Yeah, it's, 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 all, it's all as plain as day, isn't it? What an awesome testimony, young man. A blessing to many. Amen. From Sonny. Oh. Thanks, Sonny. Wow. Um, so encouraging to hear his parents prayed for him. I'm praying for my daughter to believe in God. Wow. Oh. You're not alone. You, you are not alone. Well, it's our children really are the, big one, the target of the enemy these days, particularly. Yes. I mean, they've turned what the scripture calls good into evil and evil into good, you know, so that, you know, you say, oh, wicked man, when really it's not, it is wicked. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and so, but our youth are facing probably the hardest, uh, if you like, challenges 
even though amidst all the, the good things that we've got, we, you know, when you compare how people are living in Addis Ababa or somewhere else in Ethiopia, um, you, you know, we've got it really good. But we always look like, you know, we, we need more, we want more out yeah. of life. And yet uh, we're led astray because of the things of this world, the attachments, the attractions. And, you know, we've got to somehow stay, stay strong. The other scripture, uh, Jonathan, that comes to mind is that as you mum and dad prayed, and you praying as well, really, basically, it's the part of the Lord's Prayer, lead us, lead me not into temptation, you know, when we're praying to our Heavenly Father. Yeah. You know, that is something, even, even as adults, you know, it's so easy to get sucked into some form of uh, rebellion, uh, you know, or, or to conform to this world's standards. So bless you. I wanted to ask you really, what are you doing now really to counter the things that, um, the, the gun and knife crime and et cetera, and with the youth and your experience that you've had, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah, so at the moment I am a youth leader in my local church and we do our weekly services. And as I even share, you know, some talks or preaching on the Sundays, I also do my best to share my testimony in a sense that the young people, to relate to the young people, to, to let them know that, you know, I may be older than you, but I've been where you've been. You know, I know this, you know, crazy stuff going around in your life, around your life, or even at your home. And it's kind of like sharing that reality, because there's no point sharing your story with the young people when, you know, they want the truth. And I thank God, you know, for the opportunity to share that with them so that they know that they're not alone and that there's a way out. Um, and also with my, I, I do some rapping, so even with my music, I share my story of, you know, where I was and how I got out. Because, you know, in that gang culture, a lot of people think there's no way out. You know, whenever I watch these documentaries, they're like, nah, there's no way out, like, this is it. And it hurts me, I'm like, yo, there, there is a way out, <laughs> you know, way. Right? And it's like, you know, that way out was for me, Christ because he showed me the light. I remember I was praying when I, came, when I wanted to come out, I didn't know how to, I was like, Lord, if, if you can take me out, just take me out of the street life gang. And the way he did it, like, I wish I could explain the way he did it, it's it just crazy. And literally, I just didn't know how he did it, but he did it. And I knew that, wow, if God can do it for me and do it with me, how many more? So through my music, I just share my story, um, giving hope to those in the street, or may not be in the street, but in a gang culture, that, you know, if you think there's no way out, there is a way out, um, and God knows how to get us out and to keep us. And the video is? Thoughts and Feelings. Watch this. Woo! 2019! Hey, been a while. Hey fella, say waga, yeah yeah G-Man's back from the slumber Yeah yeah G-Man's out of the matrix, been fighting off demons, no agents See demons roaming about the sea with my bros with lies and doubts Fam, was too scared to point things out, but I'ma stand up, let them know there's a way out Yeah, bring a bit of hope on this one, bring a real talks on this one They're gonna point things at me, cause I don't fit in their box Tough luck, well, I'ma be here till I go home, home I'm a got a new home, where? New Jerusalem, no postcode You can come through, fam, better know, better know, better know I'm a new breed, don't grab before I die Back with a new thing, new flow, new mind, new content. Yeah, I know about gang chat and nonsense in the studio. Raw bear bars, great, it just bars to give you deep stars. Now I'm riding bear bars with my own star truth first, but I'm not ashamed of my own past. Now, my past are the gems and stones. I was an ace trying to check your phones. If you had hard beats on your brick phone, don't know, I'll be like every one of those. My past are the gems and stones. I was an ace trying to check your phones. If you had hard beats on your brick phone, don't know, I'll be like every one of those. Being on road was a lesson. Being being up was a testing. Being locked up was stressing. To have a new life is a blessing. You never stab me, but it's cool, G. I forgive you because you forgave me. Think I'm a waste man for doing this. No, this takes a real change, man, to forget. Oh, no, I can't play reporter. Grab a sword, take that algebra. Not saying I'm the next man that are. But it's why start change from where you are. Where you are in your heart, that's the part which needs fixing up. Yes, it's hard. That's why I give mine to the main Cause no man, no thing can fix your heart. Never. Man, no stool scoop facing. Man, ain't got time for that. Join girls cause you're roasting? 
man ain't got time for that. Live like Hannah Montana, but not the real me, man ain't got time for that. Killing my bros, cars the blocks, I break God's sets, I'm free from that. Yo, no thing, that don't work for me. Found the truth, you can live again, my G, God's plan. You can live again, my G, like A star, man, just did a 180. Breathe again, sin free, new living, born of him in me, he's dwelling. All saved, no works, just believing. One Christ, my G, he's risen. So a man, them owe me money, I'm like, okay. I hear no updates from them and I'm like, okay. No more chasing you. Keep that money, fam. It's okay. Ain't gonna worry. God's got me and he's telling me it's okay. 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 Man's 25 now. Okay. All my sins are covered. Okay. No luck. It's all grace. Okay. Hungry like Melly. Okay. Give me a beat. I'm munching. Okay. Get off why I'm so hyped up like this. I got eternal life in me. Okay. 2013, yeah, yeah. I was getting to know her. 2014, had to pray, chop my heart with my father. 2015, mmm, now we're together. 2018, got the ring, put on the finger. Nah, it wasn't a quick thing. Need to make sure I was doing the right thing. Can't be breaking over heart again. Too many hearts are broken, I can't mend. But I'm still hoping they forgive me. But they forgive the old me. This year, go winning, you'll see. Of course, and feelings. Thoughts and Feelings by Jonathan Mensah. Brilliant. Was that a U87 Neumann mic? Pardon? <laughs> was the mic a U87? Um, it was... Uh, Neumann. I'm trying to remember. That was just... It, yeah, it was quite a while ago, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. You're getting technical, Howard. No, no, it's just <laughs> I, I was in the music industry many years ago. And I, you know, that was, it was a good mic. Oh. Nice mic. Uh, excellent. So... When you look at the way in which the gangs have actually taken the music to a different level, uh, what's it called? Military or whatever? Oh, drill. Drill, drill that's music, it. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they've actually twisted music again. You know, I know you'll probably know by now that, you know, that, that uh, in heaven, apparently, you know, old Nick there was in charge of the music, yeah. you know? Um, so music is actually quite a, a, a wonderful thing, but it, it's just a shame when it goes um, haywire and literally gets taken over by demonic uh, influences. So drill music is actually the opposite of what you, you've done there. You're talking about redemption and yeah. uh, coming to know Christ. But drill music is all about what? Drill music is funny because I'm still learning about it, but from what I've researched and what I've heard, it's literally young people, or even young people, or even just a group of people just talking about their environment, and sometimes it's about threatening their enemies, how they're gonna kill them, how they're gonna beat them up, and, you know, glorifying material things that they have, and that's what is shown to me through listening to their music or when people are explaining about the Drew music scene that's going on at the moment. And, you know, some may say, you know, it's impacting more violence. Some may say, you know, it's hyping up people. Some may say it's just showing hatred to the enemies. But whatever they're doing, they are influencing people. And that's what I believe, you know, even with my music, I'm influencing people, whether they want to listen or not. Uh, the message is still being given and you know with every message even the word of God even if an unbeliever hears the word of God the word of God still carries power um, and it will affect that person's life in some part so um so yeah with drill music there's a lot of stuff going on in there and I do hope that you know that drill music they will come to the light that you know yes this is your reality but there is a way out Music's powerful, and it's great to see that you have access to a studio. Is it your own studio, or is it the church? Oh, one of my friends, yeah, he's a music producer. Well done. Brilliant, because I think music's very important. Yeah, it what is. got me when I was a kid. We I didn't to... get into gangs, I got into music. We <laughs> need to use every platform that we can, Howard, to, to meet people at the point of their need. Yeah. You know, we need to be relevant. We don't water down the message. Yeah but we need to be relevant to people in a dying world, you know? Mm. But we also, as Jonathan actually alluded to, is that governments and whatever you, their, their budgets are just not there to help pe young people do things, get them involved in positive things like music, like, a, you know, there should be a recording studio in every community for people to use for free. Um, it's like I remember when I was in Tampa, Florida for... Uh, just starting a studio there. I had that studio there for 10 years. I worked with a young black guy All right. who actually sold 35 million records in the end. Wow. wow. But he ran out of money and he had a bit of an attitude with me. Mm. And he said, 
I could see, I said, listen, no, no, I can see, look at white guy, no talent, you know, all the, all the goodies, <laughs> black boy, all the talent, you know. I said, well, you picked the wrong guy. So I helped him for about two years to get on the ladder and he called me about 15 years later and said, I sold 13, 35 million wow, records. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, quadruple, uh, what do you platinum. call it? Platinum wow. albums in the top, you know, the, what have it, the bill, billboards? Oh, billboards, yeah. yep. Billboards. Yeah, but he was only like 19 when he came oh, to me. Oh, wow. You know. But sadly, he dropped dead no. uh, when he was 49. Oh, yeah, he was coming over to Spain to help me. Because uh, <sighs> he just, uh, I think he'd probably taken too many drugs or whatever, but mm -hmm. see, he, he was the son of a preacher. And uh, yeah. we used to have lots of chats, but, you know, the thing is, he was a good lad at heart, but music's so powerful. Yeah. So. Yeah, We've really got a couple is. of more minutes. Yeah, let's no, there's no more emails at the moment? No more emails. No more emails. Not from Mum? <laughs> Mum, <laughs> Mum, where are you? Yeah, all your prayers work, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> and Dad, of course. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. Um, where can we end, round this up, Jonathan? What would you like to say to young people who perhaps, you know, sort of what could be watching this programme and they're, they're so influenced, they want to be, just as you said, they want to be accepted, they want to be part of a, of, of a group of people, you know, and uh, they'll do anything to to really be acceptable. And, and I can understand that. We all want to be acceptable. Yeah. We want to be loved, liked, whatever. And uh, so what would you say to them? You can look at that um, camera over there. I'll say that, you know, I know it's a cliche thing, but it is hard being a young person. And, you know, God is so good that as a young person, you've got so many years ahead of you. And to cut your life short in doing things that you may think is right, you may think feels good, you may think seems good, but in all honesty, when we think we when something feels good, it's not truly good if we're losing out of life, if we're losing out of, you know, true identity, true purpose. And I know sometimes you may feel like you're stuck, you may feel like you're alone. And that's what the devil wants. That's what the world wants you to feel. That's why it just keeps filling you up with all these temperamental things that won't last forever. So, and even for those, you may come from a broken home. You know, I know how that feels. I have experienced that, but that is not the end. Because when you come out of that, when you see things through heaven's eyes, there's so much more. And like, you, wouldn't, you couldn't even imagine it. You have to come in whole heart, in humility and openness, and know that, you know what, this ain't the life I want. I know this ain't the real me. And, you know, I know there could be that fear of, oh, but if I leave my friends, or if my friends leave me, I won't be a nobody. Mate, like my friend, you were somebody when you were born. You were even somebody before you were born. So don't let your friends, don't let the media, don't let the drugs and the weed or the money make who you are. Because you were already someone before you were born. And I know that as the truth because the one who is truth told me that. And I've seen it and I'm experiencing it. So I'm sharing that truth for you so that you can experience it for yourself. And personally for me, if you said, okay, then how do you do it? Come to Christ, get to know him, receive him. And don't worry about changing, because I tried to do that, and I flopped. Let him do the changing, and you just enjoy the journey with him. So that's my encouragement with you tonight. Wow. I mean, I, I couldn't no, do better no, than that. No. Yeah. Should we go home own now? Program. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Monday night with Jonathan, yeah, do it live. You would see oh, that. Oh, sweet. Yeah. All right. You, <laughs> you could never need your warm-up, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we'll bring him in for the warm-up. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That one scripture Taxi. popped in my head. As he started there, <laughs> there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death, you know? Mm. And just like Jonathan was saying, it all feels right, you know, the girls, the guns, the money, the prestige, but Come in off. the end it leads <laughs> to <laughs> death, you know? That's true. Yeah. What a but story. we all have those temptations we of do. some sort, yeah. one way or another. And uh, it is... It's, well, come back to that prayer, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Yeah. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Jonathan, I, it's just amazing. You know, God bless you. And, um, should we just pray? Yeah, we've Jonathan. got less than a minute, so, yeah. 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 Is, is the Lord coming? I wish he was. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he was, yeah. Go on, lead us in prayer. Yeah. Lord, we thank you for Jonathan. We thank mm. you for the, uh, the life, the Zoe life, the eternal life that you've given him. You chose him from before the foundation of the world, Lord, and I thank you that your spirit has quickened his spirit and that you, you've moved in and you've taken residence in Jonathan for eternal life. Father, may the words and the effect of this show that Jonathan has spoken through tonight affect so many multitudes of people and bring them into the kingdom of God, just like this young man, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Jonathan, thank you so much. And may you go on to do great things for the Lord and his kingdom and bring more people in. Good night. God bless you all.